Right. So let me begin by taking you back in time. So the time is now 10 past 5 on the 28th of December, 1978. And in the skies above Portland, Oregon, there is a DC-8 that's flown from Denver and it's just coming into land at Portland International Airport and there are 189 souls on board. So, as they're coming into land, they start to lower the undercarriage, and when they do, there's a big, loud thump. It's something that they can hear, even feel in the cockpit. The whole aircraft shakes. So it's not much of a surprise when Portland Approach tell them to continue their descent, and they say, no, 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 we're going, we're going to go back up to 5,000 feet, and we're going to circle for a while, because we've got a, a landing gear problem. Landing gear problems aren't a big deal for a big commercial jet. They, they can land without any undercarriage at all. They can land with only half their undercarriage. This is fairly normal. There are actually a surprising number of, of landing gear failures that happen every year, believe it or not. You, they don't make the news because nothing interesting happens. Nobody dies. So it's a huge surprise when, after some fairly regular ordinary radio traffic from United 173, Portland hear this one. Portland Tower, United 173 Heavy, Mayday. We're, the engines are flaming out. We're going down. We're not going to be able to make the airport. And just a few seconds later, they impact power lines near Northeast 158th Avenue and East Burnside Street. That's downtown Portland, very close to the real-time Comp Hotel, actually. That's what it ended up looking like. Um, amazingly, only 10 people died, uh, although 24 were ser seriously injured. Most of that was because they hit a tree. Um, it was luckily a small wooded area in the middle of housing. So they were very lucky. And in fact, there was a, uh, a rescue team airborne on an exercise when they hit the ground. So uh, this is air crashes. Uh, just in case you got confused and thought that last picture was a recursive make file or something. <laughs> uh, I'm Dave Cridland, and I've been working in and around the internet for an embarrassingly long time now, so long that I can even remember when Google was an open standards company. Uh, I work for a company called Shorevine. Um, my colleague Lloyd, also oh, just over there, also speaking. Uh, works with us as well, and we do sort of social stuff on the web for people who really care about security. So when I got into air crashes, or reading them, and reading the reports, this was way before they were all on the web, which they are now, it's great, and they have pretty animations to tell you what happened. But I got into them because a company I worked for about 15 years ago the CEO there would hand you aircraft crash reports and tell you, just read this one, it's great. And I would say, well, you know, why, why, why do I care about that? Because I don't do anything with aircraft, I work with software. And he said, well, yeah, but aircraft are large, complex systems of interacting components, and so is software, so is the software that we build, which was incidentally server-side JavaScript, it'll never take off. Uh, and the kinds, of, uh, the kinds of errors that you get, oh, sorry, skipped a bit. Um, what we do to avoid errors is we deal in redundancy and decoupling, and that's the same with aircraft as well. So the failure cases that we get are typically complex error chains. They call them error chains in aviation. We tend to call them cascade failures, same thing. And even the name that we use for a serious failure is the same. And with aircraft, every time an aircraft does not function as it should, then there is a detailed investigation analyzing every cause and all possible recommendations afterwards. It's not quite the same <laughs> in software. <laughs> Thank you. 
So I've read, uh, I've read dozens of accident reports and summaries, and actually, I'm still not scared of flying. Um, I took two flights to get here. Um, I had to change at Schiphol. It's my airport of choice for changing for some reason. Um, there's only two accident reports that actually really leave me feeling quite scared about, uh, about everything. Um, out of curiosity, how many people flew here? That's great. How many people are thinking of flying back? <laughs> OK. We'll change that, don't worry. <laughs> so what happened with United 173? Why on earth did that plane crash? So this might give you a hint, just a small one. So when it took off from Denver, Colorado, it had 46,700 pounds of fuel. They, they like their imperial measurements there. When it was on the, uh, the approach to Portland, we can estimate very accurately from its flight plan, from how it actually flew, uh, we, can, we can be pretty sure it had about 14,800 pounds of fuel left. Uh, we know that because its undercarriage was down, the flaps were down, it was circling at 5,000 feet. We know that, that all of that is not very optimal. So we know that it's burning about 220 pounds a minute. And that's borne out by the flight engineer report at about 1738. And the flight engineer is a third, a third flight crew member. They don't often have them on modern aircraft, actually. Uh, he sits behind the pilots. He's got a bank of instruments in front of him. He's got the full readouts of everything. The, the two pilots, uh, the captain and the first officer, they've only got a, a, the, uh, the headline figure. So, they're kind of, so in order to check exactly how much fuel you've got, you tend to ask the flight engineer. But nevertheless, they've got a headline. By 1746, they've got 5,000. And the flight engineer is reporting this to the first officer, who's at this point the pilot flying, uh, while the captain is sorting out problems. And the, the pilot, the pilot in charge, the captain in normal speak, tells the flight engineer to prepare for a landing with 4,000 pounds of fuel. And you can see that's only, that's five minutes after he had 5,000. There's something wrong here. The first officer requests a, a fuel check again at 1755. He's told 4,000. The, the captain then tells Portland, we're going to land with about 4,000, well, make it 3,000 pounds of fuel. This is clearly not right. Six minutes past six, the flight, first officer tells the captain, we're, we're going to lose an engine, buddy. And the captain says, why? He says, fuel. Well, activate the cross feeds. So they activate the cross feeds to shuffle fuel between tanks. And then they think it's a good idea to ask for a landing clearance a minute later. A couple of minutes later, the, the flight engineer is reporting only 1,000 pounds of fuel. And then Mayday is declared at 1813 with the engines pretty much all running out. The report basically said, this accident exemplifies a recurring problem with management of crew resources. And this was an odd phrase to use. And the blame was assigned purely to the captain, who was stripped of his pilot's license, and as far as I know, never, never recovered, never flew again. Um, the contributing factor was given as crew failure. So they're not saying the landing gear was a problem. They're not saying the fuel was a problem. They're saying this is a crew problem. This is rather unfortunate, as the flight engineering question, Forrest Frosty Mendenhall was one of those killed in impact. Before I go on to relate it to the other crashes which this is referring to, it's um, as a top aircraft safety tip, does anyone know where the safest place to sit in an aircraft is? Because it turns out that it's the passenger seats. If you're crew, you, your odds aren't good when you, hit, when you hit a crash. You're much more likely to die. Be a passenger. It's much better. So the related crashes, which are all very, very similar, 
Uh, there's a 1963 Tupolev 124 crash into the Neva River. Um, what happened was there was a landing gear problem on takeoff, in fact. They couldn't retract it properly. So they decided they would uh, circle round to use up fuel. This is in the days before aircraft tended to dump it. And um, they simply looped too many times, ran out of fuel, landed in the Neva River uh, with amazingly no casualties. They, uh, they didn't even evacuate the aircraft. They just towed it. Great. Um, 1969, Scandinavian uh, 933, a landing gear problem. They failed to watch the altitude, crashed short of the runway, 15 people killed. Uh, 1972, Eastern 401, very famous crash uh, for aviation crash buffs like me. Um, landing gear problem, they disengaged the autopilot by accident, uh, causing uh, 99 fat fatalities when they crashed into the Everglades. And then the big one, the Tenerife Airport disaster. So the, we're now back to the 27th of March, 1977. I'd never heard properly the opening lines to Abba's Knowing Me, Knowing You before, but they seem particularly poignant for this. Um, all the songs, by the way, uh, were number one at the time, that, uh, at, at the time in question. So it's about 6 o'clock in the evening, and we're at an airport called Los Rodeos in Tenerife. Um, the airport name has now changed, by the way, to Tenerife North. Uh, what you find is that flight numbers tend to get put out of service when there's a big crash on them. And it turns out that they do this, they did this with this airport as well. In fact, they built a whole new airport. This is a cascade failure. It's a, a chain of errors leading to a final, a final fatal disaster. It starts off with a bomb that explodes in Las Palmas, the airport on Gran Canaria. Um, it was actually done by uh, Canary Island separatists protesting against the Franco regime, which was just still in at that point. Franco actually dies later that year. Um, there was another bomb warning given, although there wasn't, in fact, another bomb. So they closed the airport and diverted everything in flight to Los Rodeos. It is a much, much smaller airport. Los, Re Ros Los Rodeos has an interesting problem. It's a relatively high altitude air uh, airfield. It's at 2,000 feet or about 600 meters. So it has a problem with dense low cloud occasionally sweeping across the airport. And it had this at the time. They also had an unusual amount of traffic. Normally, they wouldn't see very much international traffic. Now, their entire airport is full. The two aircraft in question are the KLM flight 4805 with 248 people on and Pan Am 1736 with nearly 400 people on. Uh, these are both Boeing 747s. They've both flown internationally. So, uh, and I, for attribution's sake, I pulled this, uh, pulled this diagram off Wikipedia and adjusted it to fit. But this is, um, this is basically what happened. The KLM flight was, was uh, first in the queue to take off. In effect, it was blocking all of the others. Uh, the apron there, that's where the aircraft park, it's where the terminals are, things like that. That was completely jammed full of aircraft. So they couldn't use the normal taxiway that you, that you see that runs across the, uh, across the top there. So the KLM flight is first to take off does what's known as a back taxi. It runs down to the end of the runway, turns around, and is ready to go. And the Pan Am follows it fairly quickly afterwards uh, with the intent of turning off once they got past the apron. And they're a little confused about which taxiway to use. The dense fog is really not helping them at this point. And they're, they're told, when they ask for clarification, to use the third one, so one, two, three, third one. Uh, for whatever reason, though, you can see the Pan Am misses the third one. It's clear from the voice transcripts that they actually didn't have a clue where they were on the runway. Um, but that's okay, because the control tower knows that they're still on the runway, so we're fine. The KLM flight, um, piloted by a very experienced captain called Van Zanson, he was actually their chief instructor at the time, um, he actually gets to the end, he gets lined up, and he starts moving the throttles forward. 
And his first officer says, wait a minute, we don't have ATC clearance. That's air traffic control clearance, which you get before takeoff clearance, by the way. So he says to, uh, to go ahead and ask. And so they, uh, they ask, the tower gives them the clearance. ATC clearance, this is not takeoff clearance. And so they repeat the instructions back. And now what happens is something that's really quite seriously horrible. Because the tower responds with OK. And what you're seeing there is the, the normal type is what both aircraft can hear. Due to radio interference, though, only Pan Am can hear the stuff in italics. Except you guys probably don't call it italics. You call it M or something. <laughs> but so they hear, the KLM flight simply hears OK, which is non-standard, but whatever. They don't hear, stand by for takeoff, I will call you. They don't hear the Pan Am response of no. Uh, and we're still taxiing down the runway, the Clipper 1736. They do both hear, uh, Papa Alpha 1736, report the runway clear. I don't know whether the KLM crew thought that this meant that they had reported the runway clear, that the tower was reporting the runway clear. Tower never calls the Pan Am flight Papa Alpha at any time other than this one message, so it could be confusing. Either way, they push forward the engines. There's, as they start to roll, the flight engineer says, the American, he, he's clear then, and gets a very definitive Yavel from the captain and possibly the first officer. The transcript's very unclear. Yavel, by the way, for those of you who don't speak Dutch, means absolutely fucking lutely So they're rolling down the runway. Clearly, the flight engineer is a bit worried, but the captain's overruled. In the Pan Am flight, they can't see each other, remember? We've got dense cloud. Suddenly, they start to see the lights wobbling down the runway. And he says, there he is. Go down, that son of a bitch is coming. So they try and pull the Pan Am flight off. They turn it, engines on full, in a rather unusual maneuver in a 747. They're not meant to corner that fast. And tries to get into to the exit four. As the KLM flight rolls down, they call V1, which is the point, if you've, if you've been in an aircraft, that was a stupid thing to say. As you're rolling down, you know at that point where the aircraft is now rolling fast enough that they can tip back to what they call the rotate. That's, that's V1. So they're, they, they're at V1 at this point. That means that they, their nose is pointed up, which means that they can no longer see the runway as clearly but they still can see it, and the captain sees the Pan Am flight at the last minute. And he pulls back even harder, causing what's called a tail strike, where the rear of the aircraft the tail ends up, um, ends up striking the runway, and it gouged a big hole in it, in fact. And he manages to get it just about airborne, but the KLM flight is full of fuel. They refueled before departure at Los Rodeos, and it cannot quite clear the Pan Am flight. So you get this, this impact. And this is what the, uh, the CVR transcript says. Just exclamation expletive. That's actually the last that anyone will hear from the KLM flight. It impacts, um, more or less breaking apart, uh, all the way down the runway. Um, everyone's killed on that pretty much instantly. Um, the fact that it's full of fuel just means that the, the fire is pretty horrific. The, the fire crew at Los Rodeos immediately head to the KLM flight, but even they aren't aware that there are two aircraft on the runway, and they mistake the Pan Am flight initially for just another piece of burning wreckage. When they eventually get there, 61 survivors have, have escaped by themselves, and 335 people are still sitting in the aircraft, patiently waiting what to do. A top tip when you get in a plane, by the way, is listen to the safety briefing, plan your exit. It may come as a surprise that you need to use it. So the, 
So the airline industry started using what they call crew resource management, which is a doctrine where everyone in the crew maintains situational awareness, knowing what's going on, knowing that there is another plane, knowing that the fuel is running low. All of this information must be shared in the team. Planning and decision-making should be shared. Although you have a single leader who makes the ultimate decision, they need to make sure that everyone has voiced their objections to, or possible objections and opinions on the plan. Communications both inside the cockpit and outside are vital, or inside and outside the team, if you like. And good teamwork, by which I mean that everyone gets on with the specific tasks they need to, rather than trying to get everyone to do the same task. This isn't really a leadership talk. In fact, this is mostly a talk about lots of people dying hideous deaths. But it, it wouldn't be a leadership talk even if I was only talking about crew resource management, because leading people is just one person's job. And effective teamwork is everybody's job. The entire team needs to be involved. So crew resource management was taken on by United in particular in 1980, following uh, various talks by NASA. It turns out that they had been using it in their Apollo program. And it was thought that this was going to help minimize crew problems, crew failures, as the NTSB report put it, um, in the future. So what happens if a, uh, if a crew faces what would normally be an unsurvivable incident, but they've got excellent crew resource management? So, this would be United 232. On the 19th of July, 1989, at just after quarter past three in the afternoon, um, near Sioux City, Iowa, a DC-10, that's a three-engined airliner, the significance of which will become apparent in a minute, was flying from Denver to Chicago with 296 souls on board. An unusual number of these were children because it happened to be United's Children's Day special. And at just after quarter past three, after an uneventful climb to altitude, the rear central engine blew. The fan, the main turbine disc, in fact, um, shattered into several pieces, and the pieces went through the tailplane assembly. What that left United, United 232 with was two problems. Firstly, the aircraft had a marked tendency because of the damage to turn to the right. Left alone, it would simply flip itself over completely. You don't want to do that in a, in a jetliner. However, that on its own is not a major problem because you've got the aircraft's controls to compensate, move it back on track. So this would only be a serious problem if they'd lost all the hydraulics, which they had because all three hydraulic systems were put, made inoperative. Each hydraulic system is driven by an engine. Obviously, they'd lost their number two engine, so they'd lost number two hydraulics, but they had punctured lines for one and three, and all of the hydraulic fluid had simply drained out of the system. So the flight engineer, Dudley Dvorak, on the radio, in fact, to United Maintenance says, this is United 232. We blew number two engine. We've lost all hydraulics, and we're only able to control uh, level flight with the asymmetric power settings. We have very little rudder or elevator. In fact, they had no rudder or elevator or ailerons or flaps or speed brakes or even the little brakes on the wheels to slow them down should they ever land. Um, the maintenance then had a really, inter a really interesting and amusing conversation, which basically went something along the lines of, oh, you've You've lost number two hydraulics, but you've still got one and three, right? No, 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 we've lost all three. Oh, you've lost number three. Oh, that's okay, you've still got one and two, right? It took them a long time to realize that what they'd done was lost them all. This was calculated as being a 10 to the nine to one. It's one billion to one chance. And so the United have checklists for all eventualities, except this one. It's deemed impossible, and it's deemed unsurvivable. Uh, the captain, Al Haynes, saying, OK, we're trying to go straight, but we're not having much luck. 
The crew immediately sorted out the engine problem itself, the initial problem. They shut down the engine within 14 seconds. Um, it was then that they realized that the plane wasn't reacting, and they started talking all through themselves about every single operation they were doing. They decided they would continue using the controls just in case it was having any effect. Um, pretty much everything that this crew talks through, everything that this crew has to do is talked through as an entire team before they make a decision. Um, Al Haynes, maintaining a sense of humor. We didn't do this thing on my last performance check. And then something really quite remarkable happens. This is real Hollywood moment. One of the passengers comes up to help. Now, Al just introduces himself. My name's Al Haynes. And the passenger introduces himself. Hi, Al, Danny Fitch. Danny Fitch has been working for the last, oh, three or four weeks or so as United's DC-10 flight instructor. He is the one person that you really want in the cockpit. <laughs> and this is in part because he's familiar with another crash, Japan Airlines 123. Now, if the Tenerife Air disaster is the most serious aviation disaster ever, and it is, then this is the most serious single incident air disaster ever. It's the 12th of August, 1985. It's just after 6 o'clock in the evening. It's beginning to go dark. Um, the plane took off from take Tokyo, Japan. Uh, was climbing to altitude. By the way, it's a 747 short-range variant, which carries extra people, which is uh, yeah, a, a tragedy in itself that this should happen to this aircraft. So as they, as they flew up to altitude, a bad repair to an aft bulkhead caused by a tail strike several years ago caused an explosive decompression. And I shall use my laser pointer at this point. Can you see there, there's a bit missing on this plane. The entire vertical stabilizer has got blown off. Um, that has taken out all of their hydraulics. They've got total hydraulic loss, just like United 232. And they managed 35 minutes of flight time very, in a very, very unstable aircraft because they were not only missing control surface uh, control, they were missing uh, large chunks of the aircraft. They ended up crashing in a remote mountainous area very late one evening. Uh, initial reports suggested no survivors. They got a helicopter over there when they found it. Um, one of the four survivors who they found the next morning said that she heard the, the helicopter circling, could see the lights, and the helicopter flew off. And over the course of the night, all the moaning from the other survivors also faded to nothing. As you might guess, this is the other one that really freaks me out. So back to United 232. I'm looking really, really shaky on time, but we'll get there. Oh, that's all right. In that case, I'll take ages. <laughs> so United 232. Al Haynes is in no illusions about how survivable this event is. He's here, he's talking to the, uh, to the cabin crew lead, um, who I can't remember the name of, that's terrible. Um, and she's talking about whether or not they're, they're going to evacuate the plane. And he says, look, I mean, if, if we're standing up at the front, then we'll tell you to evacuate, but I, I really have my doubts. You'll see us standing up, honey. He also comments, of, won't this be a fun landing? As I say, the air crew talk about, um, about every decision, and one of the decisions that they talk about is, is how and whether to lower the landing gear. As I said at the beginning of this talk, an aircraft can land without any landing gear at all. If you're landing on a soft surface, that's actually preferable, uh, because otherwise the, air, the landing gear will sink into the surface and it will jerk and break off, and it will likely cause more damage. Um, they decided unanimously they were going to lower the undercarriage, but there turned out to be two mechanisms for doing so. So they discuss it through, and they decide to crank the undercarriage down, which will release the outer, a outer ailerons, potentially releasing some extra hydraulic fluid that they may get some control out of. 
So they get closer and closer to Sioux City a Airport um, under the very excellent guidance of um, a, a guy called Kevin Bachman, uh, who's, a, um, who's a flight controller who actually moved to Sioux City uh, because he was at a busier airport and he didn't like the stress. <laughs> um, he gives them a, a weather readout and says, you're cleared to land on any runway. Al Haynes replies with typical humor. You ought to be particular and make it a runway. They line up for runway 22. 22. Uh, that's actually a closed runway. Um, you cannot see the whole of the runway from the tower. Uh, it's an old World War I vintage runway. It's also where they've got all the emergency equipment parked right now. So they move that, and they manage to move it all out of the way clear. So as they're coming in to land, and it's, it's incredible that they've got as far as a, a, an airport, I should stress. Um, as they're coming in, a normal landing in a DC-10 is 140 knots. 200 feet per minute. They are now coming in at 215 knots and increasing, and 1,850 feet per minute. That's nearly 10 times faster than they should be on a rate of descent. Oh, is that going to fail? See, I shouldn't have controlled it with JavaScript. Let's, let's try that again, sorry. So this is a similar view that you get from the tower. So Kevin Bachman sees roughly that from the tower, and in his own words, he went down the stairs and had a little cry. But amazingly, there were survivors. Um, although 112 were killed, or 111 according to the official report, there's a complication with how you measure fatalities in air crashes. Um, but 111 were killed, instantly one was killed just after a month. Um, a third of these were due to smoke inhalation, but amazingly, 184 survived. That's almost two-thirds. Um, there was a, a deadheading um, United captain in first class, who was one of the very few survivors from first class, uh, who actually climbed out of the window. And when told, but you can't climb out of an aircraft window, he said, oh, yes, you can. <laughs> um, when the flight lands, you can't really see this, but it, it comes in um, the right wing tips at the last minute, and they couldn't control this, unfortunately. And so the right wing hits, uh, that tears off, spills fuel everywhere, everything ignites. The tail breaks off, causing the aircraft to flip up. It bounces along the runway, loses the entire cockpit assembly, then starts breaking apart. The, it, it looks like it cartwheels, and the initial news reports say that, but actually it's the left wing flipping over. So the whole thing is now upside down. Um, the passengers help the crew the cabin crew as much as the cabin crew helped the passengers. Uh, some of the cabin crew were strapped in in a full, full point harness, as they are, and unable to actually release themselves. Um, one passenger, having got himself out of a hole in the side, uh, went back in because he heard a baby cry, and eventually found the baby had been thrown into the overhead luggage bins. But if you're like me, you really want to know what happened to the, to the crew. So the cockpit wreckage was eventually found over half an hour later. It was squashed down to waist high. I've seen pictures, unfortunately, not on the internet, but it, it goes down to about there. And this is a uh, part of the plane that should be 10 feet high. They found it, though, because the flight engineer, uh, Dudley Dvorak, had his arms stuck up through some of the wires and things that was there. So they realized that there were, in fact, people inside that. So they went and they found the entire flight crew alive, albeit fairly battered and injured, um, but all of them alive. And quite amazingly, all of the flight crew survived and returned to work, most of them within three months, 
Um, Denny Fitch, who was very badly injured, he was actually sitting behind operating the throttles for them. Um, he had nerve damage to one arm, was told he'd never fly again, but nevertheless managed to some 11 months later on DC-10s, incidentally. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay, that's good. So, <laughs> so these are quotes from a, uh, a talk by Al Haynes back to NASA, in fact, to the NASA Ames Center, and the whole talk you can find on YouTube, and it's great. He said, up until 1980, we worked on the concept that the captain was the authority on the aircraft, and what he said goes, and we lost a few airplanes because of that. And we had 103 years of flying experience there in the cockpit, trying to get that airplane on the ground, not, mon not one minute of which we had actually practiced, any one of us. So if I hadn't used CRM, if we had not let everybody put their input in, it's a cinch we wouldn't have made it. The work that we do, for most of us anyway, will never involve human lives, will never involve anything like that. But nevertheless, you can learn a lot from how to do teamwork the aviation way. Thanks very much.